We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and give us a call to ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Well, hello, everyone. Happy New Year, and I hope your families, both two- and four-legged kinds, enjoyed the holidays. Thanks so much for joining me here today on Ask the Vet as we start our 2023 year. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a board-certified veterinary oncology and internal medicine specialist, and I work at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center, where I'm broadcasting from today. We're on the east side in New York City. AMC is the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. Now, on today's show, you're going to hear a conversation between my friend Leslie Lyons, a feline geneticist and professor of comparative medicine at Missouri University College of Veterinary Medicine. And Dr. Lyons is going to talk about her new publication, which helps to pinpoint the first domestication of cats. So I know all our cat-loving listeners are going to be interested in this. She's going to talk about what the genes of these cats reveal and where the first cats became pets. So keep listening for the details. We're also going to discuss her research goals of using cats as a biomedical model to settle genetic diseases that impact both cats and people, such as blindness, dwarfism, and polycystic kidney disease. So I'm really looking forward to this or actually any conversation about cats. If you're a new listener to Ask the Vet, I just want you to know that Ask the Vet is a podcast that's available on all major platforms, thanks to our partner with Sirius XM Radio. I hope you'll like and follow us to stay up to date on timely and important pet health news. For 112 years now, the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center has been keeping families together by providing the absolute best veterinary care for pets. Now, remember, later in the show, I always answer questions uh, from pet owners. If you have a question about your pet's health, we have a new way for you to get in touch with us. You can email me and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. If you have a pencil now, the address is askthevet at amcny.org. That's askthevet at amc.org. But if you don't have a pen, don't worry, because I'm going to give this email address again later in the show. And now it's time for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the Internet's most talked about animal. A recent TikTok video of a moose shedding its antlers has racked up 18.6 million views. Here's the story. A couple in Alaska got to witness this one in a million occurrences thanks to their doorbell camera. The now viral video clip shows a moose walking up to their house, stopping in perfect view of the doorbell camera. The moose then pauses for a second, shakes its body, kind of like a dog that gets out of the swimming pool. And then you hear a snapping sound just as the moose's antlers pop off the moose's head. You see the moose gets a little bit startled and then quickly runs off leaving the antlers behind. Now remember, only male moose have antlers and they shed them once a year because they're not part of their skull, they're just kind of attached on. So once they are done impressing the girl moose, meaning when mating season is over, they shed their antlers because it allows the moose to have to carry less weight. These antlers can weigh up to 60 pounds. So in the harsh Alaskan winter, you can imagine that carrying around 60 pounds less means that you can devote more energy to keeping warm and eating less food during the winter months. So if you want to see this moose video, just Google moose in Alaska shedding its antlers, and you'll find plenty of video clips and photos of the antler episode. So now today, I'm delighted to welcome our guest and my friend, Dr. Leslie Lyons, to Ask the Vet. Simply stated, she's a feline geneticist and has been researching feline genetics for more than 30 years. She's a very fancy title. She's the Gilbraith McLaurin Endowed Professor of Comparative Medicine in the Department of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery at Missouri University. She's also 
this is another fancy title, Professor Emerita at UC Davis, California. So Dr. Lyons, thank you so much for taking time to join me here on Ask the Vet. Hey, and uh, absolutely my pleasure. What a wonderful way to start the new year and let's make it rock for cats in 2023. I know, but I had to tell the moose story to start. Well, I saw that. I saw the video and that is absolutely just fabulous. I, I've never come across antlers at all in the forest and for them to pop off on your ring doorbell is just a, it's fascinating. I hope those people kept the antlers too. Although, you know, sometimes things like antlers can't come out of the forest, you know, if it's protected land or something. So I, I don't know. I hope that people got to keep the antlers because they look right. like nice ones. Yes. Um, so let's start at the beginning of, of your incredible career journey. Did you start out want to be a feline geneticist? I mean, when I went to college, I wouldn't have even known what feline genetics was. Well, that's absolutely true. That was the same with me as well. Uh, my last name is Lyons, but um, I never, <laughs> ever thought I was going to work on cats. And, and um, you know, I, I did well in high school, so it was kind of expected of me to go pre-med or pre-vet. And so I was going through those motions. And of all things for vet school, not for med school, but to attend like the University of Pennsylvania, you had to take genetics. And uh, so it wasn't until later in my career, maybe my third year in college, that I took genetics and I was fascinated by it. I was like, oh, I, I think this is what I really want to do. I wasn't real keen on being a doctor or a vet, um, but that's kind of what was expected. Once I took genetics, yeah, I thought this was it. It was by a really great instructor, Dr. Harry Corwin at University of Pittsburgh, and there wasn't any other genetics classes. There wasn't even a major in genetics at that time. So this is about 1983 or so. And so I had to go to the graduate school of public health to take more genetics classes. So as an undergraduate, I took some graduate level classes and then, um, then stayed there as they started a actually molecular genetics program within the time that I was at Pitt with Dr. Robert Farrell at the Graduate School of Public Health. And so the biostats department became human genetics department. I graduated from there with my PhD in December 91. And during that time, I saw all this competition in human genetics. And it's like, these people are all doing the same thing. What a waste of money and they won't work together. And that frustrated me. But while at Pitt, I got exposed to people like Jim Womack and um, Steve O'Brien and various other people, Don Morzo, who did work in other species. And that's like, ah, that, that's what I, I think I want to do, go work in another species, do what was called comparative genetics at, at that time. But it's it's one health. It's It's all the same thing, comparative anatomy, comparative genetics. And so I left uh, Pitt and I interviewed with a fish guy, a cattle guy, a cat guy at DuPont as well, just to figure that out. And also considered doing forensics with the FBI. And in the end, I picked uh, National Cancer Institute and doing cat genetics because I wanted to learn more about evolution and to stay involved with human genetics and the topic there was cats. So I still just didn't pick cats because I wanted to work on cats. But people generally say it's your postdoc that sets your career. And so that's what happened in, in 92, February 92. I started working on cats. I didn't know anything about cats. I had a cat, but um, read a couple books. One was Roy uh, Robinson's uh, Genetics for Cat Breeders and Veterinarians. And the other one was Paul Leyhausen's cat behavior book. And that's what really set me on my path. So uh, you bring up the cat that you had as a postdoc. Like how many cats do you have now? Like, uh, can I see them? Are they there with you? No, I'm, I'm, here, at, I'm here at work. And uh, so I have three cats currently at home, two orange toms and a, uh, a sibling, which is actually a Siamese style you know so it's pointed cat it's not a true Siamese so she's a tortie point 
And I did find down the street at the local farm a Siamese cat. So I think he wasn't altered right away. And <laughs> they have his uh, great granddaughter or something like that as well. So I have those cats, but I, I always grew up with at least one cat and they were generally just a random bred cat that we had acquired from the farm um, or something like that. We had a cat named Steely Dan, who is all blue. And uh, Templeton was one of our favorites. He was a Red Point Siamese. Um, so we always had, my first cat's name was Withers. And I've had Revenge of Withers, a black cat with a little white uh, locket and stuff. So always had cats. Oh, it, you know, I, I think those orange boy cats are just the best. Um, they really, there's something about orange boy cats that, that are fabulous. It's their personality. Um, yeah. Well, one is called Meow Meow Kitty, and that's an ode to Mr. Rogers in Pittsburgh, where I'm from. And then the other one is Prince Harry Housen. And so that's a play on two words. If anybody knows who, who Ray Harryhausen is, he is the guy that started stop motion uh, animation, like in Sid, in the Sinbad movies and stuff like that. And I've always liked movies. And um, so being that he's also read Prince Harry and stuff like that. So, and then the females, she's just a brat. So her name is Brat Cat. Oh, that's a good one though. I like yeah. Brat Cat. Brat Cat. She has tortitude. So she's a uh, Brat Cat. Well, yeah, and the tour that is so. Can you explain? This is really not on the script, but can you explain why torties have a temper? Well, no, I can't. So, um, <laughs> yeah, because you you often say that the orange toms are really really calm and really wonderful cats, but the females that are torty, uh, which have one copy of an X with an orange uh, mutation, and the other copy is normal wild type, which gives you black. And since females need two X chromosomes, they express both in different tissues. Only females are supposed to be torty, right? So there are genes on the X chromosome that interact with serotonin and perhaps behavior. Uh, monoamine oxidase comes to mind. And whether that has anything to do with it. So there might be something true about tortitude. But it's also biased a lot by, you know, you know, it's supposed to be there. So it's it's hard to quantify. But oh, I know. My, you know my, the real reason. Yeah. My sister's had a lot of cats and her torty was absolutely the spiciest cat she had. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, OK, but we've now we've digressed. Um, so <laughs> Leslie's here because she has a recent paper published in the journal Heredity that helps to tell us when cats were domesticated. Now, um, I always thought they were domesticated in Egypt because you can find cats in the pyramid, but you're going to tell us the real story. Well, uh, the, they certainly were uh, domesticated within that region, all right? So um, wildcat studies done by um, Carlos Driscoll has shown that it's likely that cats from the Near East, and when we say the Near East, we actually mean the Fertile Crescent, and so that's a rock, Turkey, um, uh, the Levant region, which is Israel, Jordan. And the Fertile Crescent actually, in some people's thoughts, extends down into the Nile Valley as well, so into Egypt. And um, so when they say cats are from the Near East, uh, that means that region because that's where we think the progenitor, the African wildcat, may have come from. But there's another way to tell the story as well, and that is to look at the genetic diversity of cats. Which cats in the world have the most genetic diversity? And generally where you have the most, that's where cats originated from. So with any species, you, you do very similar projects. And we had previously published that we had cats from Turkey and shown that those cats were the most diverse out of the limited groupings that we had. And that cats from Southeast Asia were gen very genetically different from those cats and cats of Western Europe were very different. So we then have these populations that you could call them land race populations, racial type populations of cats that we could genetically define. So there is a cat ancestry test that is based on that information. But we also, then we wanted to kind of fill in, well, you know, there's different places where agriculture was developed. So that's the key. 
when and where was agriculture developed? So that's probably where the site of cat domestication is. But so we have the Near East, um, the Fertile Crescent region, but then also the Indus Valley region of Pakistan was uh, an area where agriculture developed and the Yellow River region of China. So we went on this quest to get cats from all over the areas, especially in that Middle East, really saturating the area and redid the analysis. And we, we come up with pretty much the same type of thing that the cat diversity is highest in the Near East so can you say Turkey is different from Israel, is different from Egypt? Not really. Those cats are all kind of mixing around. And um, uh, we know that that is definitely the site of domestication. We had no further evidence that Pakistan or China were secondary sites for domestication, as is found in other animals, like cattle have been domesticated more than once. And, um, but what was surprising to us is when we looked at the genetics of these cats, the highest diversity is in the Near East, but then it just continues to spread out. And so if you just go little steps at a time, there's little changes in the genetic diversity. And so cats are really one big, huge interbreeding population, what we would say panmictic population, randomly bred cats. And once you get to the edges, the periphery, Southeast Asia, Western Europe, yeah, those cats are different from the cats in the middle. But if you go one step at a time, it's, it's kind of, they're just a little different, little different, little different. So that was part of the big part of the story is cats are just this huge, one big interbred population, really. And, um, and really, there's, only what we think is one domestication site. Now, obviously the Egyptians probably tamed cats and bred cats. So I think cats were first tamed and, um, or actually first bred as a purposely bred by the Egyptians, uh, but probably were tamed um, throughout the Near East to be um, facilitators of vermin control. And, and that came from, you have a, a crop of grain, you don't want the vermin to eat it, so you need a nice set of cats to keep the vermin down. Right, right. all right, yeah, so rats, rodents, uh, you know, of course they're eating lizards and, and birds and things like that. And, and so what we think would happen is that a cat would decide, you know, they're gonna have some type of mutation that changes their behavior just a little bit and that behavior is gonna make them slightly more what we would say bold. And if they're bold, they'll come closer to humans. And the ones that came close to humans, it's like, hey, this is a good gig. I get pretty easy meals. And if I eat all those rats, they'll protect me. They'll let me have kittens and, um, and they'll give me extra food to keep me around. So, um, so it becomes a symbiotic relationship. So cats probably, really kind of tamed themselves oh i don't think a cat would ever admit to being tamed by a human being <laughs> i i think that that is a hundred percent correct assessment uh, you know and and the thing you left off your list though about what happened to cats when they came closer to people and became bold is we made them gods in in you know the egyptians certainly made them gods there are fabulous statues of cats all over uh, in Egypt. I've not been to Turkey or the Middle East, but there are great cat statues yeah. uh, in, in Egypt. Well, that was good and bad for cats in Egypt because they became gods, but they also became votive offerings. So an yeah. offering to the god. So the Egyptians, the priests were growing cats, killing them quite early, actively breaking their necks, mummifying them, and then you, as a, a citizen, could go buy a cheap mummy or a very expensive one, one that had a casing and everything. And, and we have found, uh, Egypt, Egyptologists have found that, you know, sometimes they scammed you. It was just wrappings and nothing was in it or a chicken bone or something like that. And then you went and prayed in case of cats to Bastet uh, for fertility and for other things. Uh, so there was millions of cats that were mummified and destroyed for for votive offerings. 
Yeah, we, we have a few of them, I think, in our museums here in New York. And yes. I think some of them have made visits to AMC's uh, CAT scanner because we've we've CAT scanned mummies for some of the New York City museums uh, we, to find out what's in them. Yeah, we actually did the DNA from a couple of the cats there from the Brooklyn Museum. Yep, yep that's, we and, scanned those yep, cats. And yeah. we showed that the DNA signature of those cats of the pharaohs, of those mummified cats, is the same mitochondrial type that is present in the Near East and in Egypt. And that mitochondrial type is not common throughout the world. So the cats currently living in Egypt are descendants of the cats of the pharaohs. And they probably were kept separate from other cats. And therefore, they, they were, were they a closed pool or a more closed pool of cats and why they, they aren't in your spreading circle of cats around the world? Well, I, I, um, I think that's more so because at that time, uh, cats come into Egypt uh, quite a bit, such as Cairo, um, because of its very metropolitan, right? That's where a lot of trade was occurring. Uh, but some of these cats might have been from Upper Egypt, which would have been Southern Egypt, closer to the Sudan. And um, so it kind of depends where they got that cat from. And those wouldn't mix around as much. So Egypt itself has a bit of a dichotomy. Some cats that are very specific to Egypt, but then cats that have intermixed because of it being metropolitan cities and trade routes. Yeah, they were probably on a boat to keep the rats on the boat down. And Absolutely. Then, then they got to Cairo and said, uh, or Alexandria probably, and hopped off the boat and said, I think I'll stay here. Nice Yeah, place. exactly. Look, yeah. lots of grain here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> lots of place, lots of grain. Exactly. Um, if, my son had a... Um, a he wanted a cat and he said, mom, I found this website. If we send $2,000 to Cairo, they'll, they'll ship an Egyptian mouth to JFK. We just have to pick it up. I was like, mm, scam dear. That, no, yeah. no, yeah. we're not. Not, <laughs> not all cats from Cairo are Egyptian mouths. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was like, no, maybe no there. Um, so you've worked with cat breeders a lot. Um, over the years to develop uh, cat data, cat DNA databases. And so um, what do you think are the similarities um, between cats and people? Well, um, it, we have to then go to the DNA. We have to look at the genome. And it's very amazing that any mammal, human, dog, pig, cat, have about 21,000 genes or so, give or take a few hundred. And most of those genes, 80% of them, are exactly the same. They create the body plan of a mammal. They create your heart. They create your limbs. They create how your physiology works. And all that is pretty much the same. Things that are obviously different is dogs will have a much more extended repertoire of genes for smell, olfactory genes. Cats have quite a bit more than humans, not as many dogs, but cats have um, more receptors for pheromones. And so uh, they have a much better pheromone receptor uh, uh, set of genes than, than dogs do. So cats are maybe interacting and smelling a little differently than, than, than a dog would. So because we have all the same genes, we have the same genes that allow us to develop our retina or to allow us to develop our long bones um, or our facial structure. And so when we find the genes in cats that cause retinal degeneration, blindness, or dwarfism because the long bones are not growing, um, or the craniofacial defect that was common in Burme Burmese cats, those genes are exactly the same genes as we find in humans and are controlling the same process. So if we can figure out what those mutations do, we can maybe figure out better therapies that could be helpful to humans, such as what we're actively doing for polycystic kidney disease. We're really, we're focusing on trying to um, develop a, actually a dietary therapy. And so we're putting cats through a, a feeding trial and hoping this therapy will be quite useful for humans as well. 
So just for the listeners out there who might not know what polycystic kidney disease is, uh, poly means many and cystic means little fluid filled like blisters. And so a cat with polycystic kidney disease, kidneys will turn into these giant little fluid filled balloons all over the kidneys. And then there's no kidney cells to do kidney work. And then the cat develops kidney failure. Um, but that disease happens in people too. And That's I don't know about it, anything in people other than people get that same disease that cats do. Absolutely right. So it's one of the most common inherited diseases. If you, uh, the number of people with PKD, you don't tend to hear about it because it affects people more when they're 50 or 60. That's when they start to go in renal failure, but they've been growing these cysts all throughout their life. We tend to hear about things that affect children uh, more often, like Duchenne's or muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis. Well, um, Tay-Sachs disease, all those combined are less common than polycystic kidney disease. So uh, it is quite a common disease in humans. And a human kidney can be bigger than a football. Um, and so it can be quite devastating Generally, you end up in renal failure, you're on dialysis for seven to 10 years, and it does tend to shorten your life by uh, about 10 years or so, if not more, and then your quality of life is compromised as well. So if, if this stuff works in cats, we're going to see uh, a nice dietary treatment for many humans that have this disease. Which I think there are probably way more people than have it than cats that have it. Do you think, uh, I, well, yeah, just because there's um, more humans that uh, can can potentially have it than um, than Persian cats. So the that's one difference. Most human families that have polycystic kidney disease, this is a very very big gene, tend to have their own what we call private mutation. Someone in their lineage has had a mutation that causes them to have disease and then it's spread in that family. So each family tends to have their own private mutation. That's to the contrary for cats. Persian cats have one mutation and Persian cats all around the world uh, have the exact same mutation. So before we found the mutation in 2004, 38% of cats, 20 to 38% of cats around the world had this mutation and this disease. Now, when I talk to commercial laboratories, they're seeing less than 7% of Persian cats being positive for PKD. And a lot of that is from areas where people are not familiar with genetic testing, such as many of the Eastern European countries and, and perhaps Russia as well. So the, it, I think it's interesting that cats around the world have this same mutation, which if we go back to what you said when we started this conversation, cats are not that genetically different across the world. And this is one of those examples where the same mutation has been perpetuated in cats around the world that causes this disorder. Yeah, definitely for Persians. Now that doesn't mean we won't find new reasons and new causes for polycystic kidney disease. There's recessive forms. We've been talking about the autosomal dominant form, but there's recessive forms as well. And, and in our lab, we're starting to maybe have some clues as to maybe there's a few other mutations, but they're not very prevalent. They're very isolated cases. So um, if I but, have a striped cat patient, you know, just a cat, and it has cysts on its kidneys. Is that likely to have the mutation that the Persian cats have? I would first go there. I would first try to get that tested. And then uh, because it is so prevalent and that Persians are have been per, historically a very popular breed, but that doesn't guarantee it's going to have it. Um, most diseases in random bred cats are novel de novo mutations that occur once and, and they really aren't perpetuated through, throughout the populations very much. So I once diagnosed a black and white mixed breed dog with the same mutation that caused phosphofructokinase as these Springer Spaniels have. And I said to my friend, Dr. Giger at Penn, um, he said, um, 
I, I said, this doesn't look like a Springer Spaniel or so how can it have the same mutation? He said, it doesn't take a lot of different genes to take a Springer Spaniel and make it look very different. And so he, his theory was that the Springer Spaniel would have had the same, uh, that there was Springer Spaniel in this dog's ancestry. I, I would agree with that before I would think that it's, that is far more likely than a totally independent dog having exactly the same mutation, but that can occur. That can occur, occur rarely. So uh, Dr. Giger was uh, mentioning what we consider something to be identical by descent. Mm -hmm. And that mutation was identical by descent. And now we have these fancy tests where you can see if your dog is part Springer Spaniel or not. And I bet that one would have fallen into that yeah, category. Well, yeah, we didn't have that test then. And so right. we were only hypothesizing, but I was like, I was, we were all excited when we, when we found the same mutation. Um, so Dr. Lyons and I were both recently in Peru at the World Small Animal Veterinary Association meeting. Uh, she went to Machu Picchu. I went to the Amazon. And one of my favorite animals in the Amazon was an animal called an agouti. And if you look at an agouti, it kind of looks like a cross between a mini pig and an Abyssinian cat because it's got a coat exactly like an Abyssinian cat. And if you look at people who do genetics of coat colors, a goody is a special kind of coat color in the cat. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and absolutely. And that's where we get the name uh, from the animal, the agouti. And they have banded fur like an Abyssinian and no stripes, no stripey pattern, right? So they just have fur that's black, yellow, black. Uh, maybe there's another yellow, black mix in there. And um, and so all we on the do, same hair, all on one hair. Yeah, one on hair. And so in the end, it's an optical illusion because it makes that animal look brown. It's not brown at all. There's no brown. It's just the mixture and the reflection of the colors that make the animal look like it's a brown animal. So most brown animals are a goody and uh, they have that banding pattern. And that's exactly what an Abyssinian is. But that's not the normal wild type for a cat. We think that's a rather newer mutation and a cat should have stripes. And uh, so they should be a mackerel tabby. And the gene that uh, causes stripes, um, that gene has been identified. And so that gene actually, um, there's two genes involved. One gene that says, turn stripes on, turn stripes off. And that's the one that allows you to have a ticked tabby, also known as an agouti um, Abyssinian. And then you have the gene that controls what type of pattern you're going to have as well. So um, yeah, all these genes are the same, a goody signaling protein, and humans have the gene too. So what's really cool about um, cats is, is Dr. Lyons is right about their stripedness. Even if you take a black cat and you shave that cat because you're going to spay it or, and you need the fur out of the way for the spay, you'll see the stripes on the cat's tummy. But unless you shave that black cat that looks like a black cat, it's it's really striped underneath. Yes, that's right. Absolutely right. So Siamese often have stripes and stuff as well. And you'll see that come in. They call it ghosting. As they get older, um, our skin gets thinner and then we produce more pigment because the cat is, is um, colder. And hence, you start to see the stripes come through. Um, well, I think that this has been such a fun conversation, but we have used up all our time and only answered half the questions that I thought we were going to get to. Well, today. we're going to have to do part two. Well, we'll, we'll do part <laughs> two sometime. So I want to thank Dr. Leslie Lyons from the University of Missouri for being here with us to talk about cat genetics. Uh, just tell, tell our listeners the lab's website in case they want to read more about what you do. Uh, absolutely. So if you Google us, feline genome, so it's uh, feline G genome at University of Missouri. And, um, and that has some of our projects up on there and how to make donations. We love donations. That's what keeps some of our projects going, especially when some people say, hey, will you do this? I'd love to do it, but we need a little bit of starter money uh, to get things rolling. So um, please donate. It's called the 99 Lives Project. And um, hopefully we, we take all kind of interesting new projects and we're working on urate stones. 
ragdolls that have one uterine horn and one kidney and always fun with coat colors too. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget, if you have a question about your pet's health, just email me at askthevet at amcny.org, and I will answer your pet health questions on next month's show. Now we're going to take a short break, but when I come back, we'll do the animal news, so stay right where you are. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Welcome back to Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM. Now it's time for today's animal news. It's time for animal headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. First, a story about a pygmy hippo. Now, you're going to think we only want to talk about hippos on this show because, you know, we've had Fritz and Fiona, the hippos from Cincinnati Zoo, that have been trending animals more than one time. But I really like hippos a lot. So a pygmy hippo is much smaller than Fritz and Fiona is. This pygmy hippo uh, weighed in at 16 pounds and was born at the Metro Richmond Zoo in Virginia. And a week later, she'd almost doubled her weight to 25 pounds. Her mother, Iris, is a very experienced mother and is doing very well after the birth of her baby daughter, Hippo. The zoo staff says the calf is healthy and nursing well. Right now, the mother and daughter are being kept away from spectators in a hay bedded enclosure so they have time to bond. But once the new baby is a bit older, she's going to take swimming lessons at an indoor pool that's visible to zoo guests. Makes me want to just go to Richmond just to see this baby hippo swimming. Zoo officials reached out via Facebook asking its followers to share name suggestions for the adorable new arrival. And here in Asavet, we'll keep you posted when a name has been chosen. Pygmy hippos are native to West Africa and are considered an endangered species. And currently there are only 2,500 adult pygmy hippos in the world. I think we have some at the Bronx Zoo just north of AMC. If you want to see the baby hippo in Virginia, just Google baby hippo at the Metro Zoo for more information and amazing photos of this cute new hairless arrival. Our next story uh, comes from Australian Wildlife Conservancy, and they're on a mission to restore a mammal species to different parts of Australia. Um, and that also will translate into improving the Australian ecosystem. Recently, they were checking nest boxes at a local sanctuary and were thrilled to find a tiny baby Eastern pygmy possum. Pygmies, I guess, seem to be our theme of the day here on Ask the Vet. One of the smallest possums in the world, this baby pygmy possum is as big as your pinky finger and weighs just seven grams. I'm going to tell you that most of us don't think about things in grams, but a raisin weighs about one gram. So this baby um, possum weighs about the same as seven plump raisins. The uh, pygmy possums are animals that were reintroduced into the sanctuary. So the presence of a baby in a nest box tells the scientists that their breeding program is working. The pygmy possums are nocturnal, they only, meaning they only come out at night. And like many mammals in Australia, they are marsupials, meaning the baby is raised in a pouch. And they're very small and rarely out during the day. Researchers don't very often get to see them. So this baby in the box um, living with its mother was a big surprise and a big pat on the back for scientists working hard to save this species. The little guy will live uh, with its mother in the nest for a bit longer and then will set off on its own. Now, in December, uh, every year, the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center hosts the Top Dog Gala. And this year, philanthropist Stephen and Christine Schwarzman were honored for their contributions to the Animal Medical Center, as well as two very special canine groups, the FDNY, or Fire Department of New York Canine Unit, and the Crisis Response Canines. The FDNY Canine Unit is a local group and they're been coming increasingly important in recent years. 
they have dogs that detect accelerants, which are things um, that make fires burn more quickly. So these dogs complete 300 hours of training in order to pick up fire accelerants, which helps the firemen to address fires before they really become out of control. And these dogs have become critical to the FDNY's life-saving mission. The Crisis Response Canines is a not-for-profit organization of dog teams throughout the United States. And these teams work in crisis environments to support communities, individuals, and also the first responders who can be affected by horrific large-scale tragedies and natural disasters. I'm happy to report that this year's Top Dog Gala raised $2.3 million to support AMC's not-for-profit mission, including education research and providing compassionate collaborative care for animals in need. If you want to see um, and read more about the Top Dog Gala, then you can just go to www.amcny.org backslash press. There's also a wonderful photo series on the Top Dog Gala on our Instagram account. It's labeled specifically Top Dog is the name of it. And don't forget that AMC's Instagram account is AMCNY. Now I'd like to share some important health information with you about keeping your pets safe during the winter. The recent bomb cyclone that really impacted dozens of states across the nation um, caused a lot of veterinary experts to worry about the health of animals during this winter storm. So we've put out uh, eight winter tips to help you keep your pets safe. First, beep your horn before you move your car in case a cat is napping in the wheel well or in the warm toasty engine. Second, don't forget that antifreeze is toxic to both dogs and cats. Don't spill antifreeze, and if you do, wipe it up immediately because it can ruin the kidneys of animals. Make sure that your pet has a cozy, warm place to sleep away from drafts, and especially if you have an outdoor dog or cat. Don't use a space heater that is tipsy and that pet could knock over. You want one with a heavy base and an exterior that remains cool so your pet doesn't get burned. And always be sure to be present when a space heater is on. Don't overbathe or shave your pets in the winter. Dogs have to go outside when it's snowy and icy. And so don't forget to have your pet wear booties or use musher's wax on their paw pads to protect those sensitive feet from salt and ice. If your dog doesn't want to go out because they have a thin coat, then maybe your dog needs a jacket or sweater when they go outside. And finally, if you have outdoor animals, make sure that your pet has a water source that does not freeze when it gets cold. Otherwise, your pet can get dehydrated in addition to being very cold outdoors in bad weather. Now, don't forget, if you have a question about your pet's health, please email me at our askthevet at amcny.org and I'll answer your question on next month's show. Now let's go to questions from our listeners. Our first question today comes from Kim. Uh, my name is Kim. I wanted to ask them about uh, the medicine Apoquil to help um, with uh, allergies and itching. I have a Yorkie mixed between a Maltese and a Yorkie and she is severely scratching and rubbing her body on furniture to the point where she's red and raw and sore and losing hair. The vet has prescribed Apoquil, but it seems to change her personality, and I've read it has a lot of side effects and can increase chances of cancer and other diseases. So I wanted to hear their take on that medication, Apoquil. Thank you. So Kim, it, it sounds like your Yorkie is really miserable with scratching and itching. And if you've, tr I can't tell from your question if you've tried Apoquel and it's not making the Yorkie better because after about a week, you should see some improvement on Apoquel. So if the Yorkie is still scratching and itching, itching after a week on Apoquel, I think you need a new plan. The other concern that I have is 
that maybe this dog has a secondary skin infection, maybe it has a parasitic skin infection, and that's why it's so very, very itchy. So if the Abiquil is not making um, your Yorkie better, then I think another trip to the veterinarian for a reassessment of the situation uh, is worthwhile. Apoquel doesn't work. I know for a fact it doesn't work in every animal, but it's a godsend in some animals. So if I misinterpreted your question and your Yorkie is much better on Apoquel, I think that providing your Yorkie with comfort from and, and relief from being so itchy is a completely reasonable um, thing to do. Um, and I think that the concern of of cancer risk on Apoquel is really quite overblown. So if Apoquel is helping, I would continue it. If Apoquel is not helping, I'd see my veterinarian for an alternative diagnosis and a different plan. Thanks so much, Kim, and I hope the Yorkie is on the mend soon. Our second question uh, comes from Sean in Cincinnati. I wonder if Sean has seen Fiona and Fritz because I'm obsessed with those hippos. Hi, Dr. Hornhouse. My name is Sean, and I'm calling from Cincinnati, Ohio. I have a three-year-old husky that has been diagnosed with a sublingual ranula. We noticed the ranula a number of months ago and have been to the family vet and referred to see a surgical uh, specialist as well. The treatment options given the removal of the sublingual and mandibular salivary glands. I would like to know your opinion on a less invasive surgery, um, mercipalization, and other alternatives, um, such as uh, medication, which I believe have been tested with some success more recently on uh, human patients. It would be great to uh, hear your opinion on this. Thank you. So. Um, Sean, thank you for your question. And you've really got the medical lingo down because I'm a little worried that our um, listeners are not going to understand your question. First, a ranula is something that is under your dog's tongue and it kind of looks like a big blister. But what it really is, is a blocked up duct from the salivary gland. And then it just like a stopped up garden hose, it gets all swollen because the saliva can't go anywhere. And so it's really uncomfortable for your dog as their tongue is shoved over to one side. Um, so the the treatments that Sean is talking about is for surgery to remove the salivary gland. And that's probably the preferred method. I know it sounds a little, Sean, Sean's worried this is too drastic, but really that has the best chance of correcting um, this problem. Because if you remove the salivary gland, then the duct doesn't have anything to fill it up and cause it to be all distended marsupialization. I can't believe that we've talked about marsupials twice in one Ask the Vet episode. So marsupialization is a surgical procedure where they open up this distended salivary gland duct and make an opening so the saliva drains into the mouth um, and, and bypasses whatever has caused the salivary gland to be blocked up. Um, that has the chance of closing down and when, if it closes down, then you're back where you started and you need the salivary glands removed. So marsupialization is, is a acceptable treatment. It probably has a smidge higher failure rate than just simply removing the salivary glands. I think the medication that Sean is talking about is kind of a nifty sounding procedure, but I'm not sure it's right for Sean's Husky. The procedure that was described was done by ophthalmologists, so eye doctors, who found the, sal the salivary gland under the eyeball was the one that got blocked up, and therefore the eye was all positioned abnormally because this salivary gland got all swollen underneath the eye. So the ophthalmologist put a little teeny tube up the salivary gland opening threaded it up into the duct, and then injected some medication into that salivary gland that seemed to work and shut it down. But that salivary gland that's underneath the eyeball doesn't have very good surgical access. And so the, the ophthalmologists were looking for a less invasive procedure than going surgically under the eyeball to get this salivary gland out. 
where Sean's dog's salivary gland is under the tongue and it's much easier for a surgeon to get to. So again, I think that that medication might be useful, but really the best chance Sean's dog has of correcting this problem is in fact removing the salivary gland under the tongue and also the one in the neck. Uh, so good luck, Sean, with the Husky in Cincinnati. Uh, let us know how things turn out. If you uh, want to email us again at askthevet at AMCNY, we'd be happy to hear how the Husky is doing. And now we're going to take a quick break and come back with news from AMC's USDAN Institute. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hi, welcome back to Ask the Vet on Sirius XM. AMC's USDAN Institute sponsors free virtual monthly pet health events. And keeping with our theme of cats, this uh, show, you, our upcoming event is How to Make Your Cat Happy. I say that's probably not possible, but we'll see what Dr. Michael Delgado has to say about making your cat happy. This event will be Wednesday, January 18th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You need to register at amcny.org backslash use Dan events. I want to thank my special guest, Dr. Leslie Lyons. Don't forget to download this podcast at your favorite podcast place. One last time, type your questions and send them to me by email at askthevet at amcny.org. Check us out on social media, Facebook, the Animal Medical Center, Twitter, and Instagram, amcny. And I'll be back.